In these days of AI and in these days of the internet, how do you know if what somebody is saying is real or it's fake? When you're hiring an employee, how do you know their resume is real or it's fake? When you're um, looking at investment, how do you know if it's real or it's fake? Uh, we are, I am delighted today to have an expert on really determining whether something's real or fake, uh, because this is a real big challenge. I mean, I have copycats, people saying that basically they do what I do. Um, and so, you know, people are easily deceived. They they like think if it's on the internet, it must be true. Uh, I, I, I Googled it or, you know, I, I uh, went into my perplexity app and I asked the question, it must be so. And, you know, so this is, the, this is a, it's a serious question. Every business owner runs into this every single day, um, both fake stuff about themselves, but also, um, you know, determining whether somebody else is real or fake. And today we have as our guest, Cynthia Hetherington. She is the author of OSINT, The Authoritative Guide to Due Diligence, um, Essential Resources for Critical Business Intelligence in, into its third edition. I just released my third edition. So I know that's a big accomplishment. So congratulations, Cynthia. So th Cynthia, thank you so much for being on our show. And if you would, um, give our WealthAbility audience an idea of um, how you became an expert in this field. Hey, Tom, it's it's great to be on the show. And I appreciate getting a chance to share some knowledge with your listeners. And, um, you know, how do we spot the fakes from the reels? Uh, I'm a founder and CEO of the Heatherington Group, a specialist in expert investigations and intelligence. Our job every day is to discern fact from fiction for our customers. So this is a really good thread to roll with, and uh, I'm excited to share my ideas with you. So let's start with what is OSINT? Um, if I'm understanding right, it's it's it stands for Open Source Intelligence. Um, what what does that even mean? And uh, and the the acronym OSINT is kind of interesting because it has a it has a history of coming from our military and intelligence community. So, you know, you think nice CIA, James Bond. I like it. Uh, oh, yes. And in fact, I, I just spent two days uh, at a summit of nothing but intelligence practitioners. And even they came out and said, what is OSINT to us? And uh, the, the key here is open source. Now, this is great because all the listeners can also do this. Open source means information that's accessible to anyone. It's it. You don't have to have a special credential to get to it. You don't have to, you know, go through hoops and, and climb ladders to get to it. This information is pretty much a Google search away. It has a, a little bit richer of a meaning, you know, in the tradecraft. But for the sake of this, you, it's it's what you get on Google. Well, so so let's kind of walk <laughs> us through it a little bit. You know, if, if you're. And let's take some uh, specific situations. Let's say that you've got a candidate. All right, now I've, um, <laughs> you know, I I hire people that are supposedly experts, right? I'm hiring a CPA who supposedly knows what they're doing um, with experience. If I wanted to hire somebody who didn't know what they're doing, I'd hire somebody right out of college, right? But I'm hiring somebody with anywhere from two to eight years experience. How do I know their resume is true. Well, the truth of what we're doing here is about, about the truth. It's about facts. So what you're going to be doing is fact finding. And um, if you can roll back to good old high school days or college, when you had to write papers, remember you had to cite your source. Yep. You had to go and put the footnotes or the end notes in there. You had to, you know, cause obviously we're college kids. So, you know, we don't really know anything though. We think we know everything. So when we made a, a statement in a document, we would have to say this statement came from this resource or location. Well, now grow up and get 20 years of tradecraft experience or, you know, expertise just like you have. And now you are looking at someone who says they're an accountant. You'll say, well, where can I find the site or the source for that? And that would be um, the uh, accountancy association for the state or maybe the consumer board for the state will tell you if that person is or isn't because they'll be licensing and they'll be credentialing that you could verify. Right. So, so I can find out, right. So clearly I can find out if they're actually CPA, but I have no idea 
if what they say their skill level is, is, tr is true or not. Is there anything from an open source standpoint that you could actually go to, to kind of verify what they're telling you? Cause right. At, it, you can, you can give them an exam. I mean, that's one thing that, that companies do um, mm -hmm. that to help verify uh, that's a long, arduous process. You can um, you know, you can talk to them, but, and they might say the right things, but, I've seen this. I mean, I've seen people really good at interviewing that were really bad at their job. And so, <laughs> so is, is there something that you can do? I mean, I, I want to start here. Then I want to go to other, other examples. Is there anything you can do from um, a hiring standpoint that would actually in the open source world that, that you might be able to search for is, are there certain ways to search for that information? Uh, absolutely. Uh, in the book, I go into the four personalities of individuals that we would be investigating because at the core of everything, we're investigators and this is how we fact find. But when we're talking about very unique expertise, I mean, this is also the place where I would, I would say this one statement and this kind of rings true my whole career. Fraud and incompetence often look alike. So what you're asking is, how do we find out if this person is capable of doing the job that they say they are? Or are they, you, you know, you're asserting that they might be lying. They might, in fact, believe in their own mind that they could accomplish this goal. Right. However, they are incompetent. So how do we test for that? Depending on the skill and the labor or the individual, you can look for past performance. And in past performance, it might be, you know, time you can say, well, I've authored a book. And I could go and I can look at Amazon or I could go to the Library of Congress or I can look in other places where your book should be, you know, registered and, and there. And I could say, OK, he indeed published a book. Um, we had a case where this woman was claiming to be a specialist in child psychology and had been testifying in court for almost 14 years. And she wasn't even a psychologist. She wasn't a so uh, she wasn't a clinical worker. She had no credentials to back up what she said. She had been passing herself off as someone in court and talking to children for over 14 years. And the way I found out if she was that she wasn't really a real doctor is I called the university that she said she graduated from. And I asked to see a copy of her credentials and they couldn't provide it. When I finally confronted her and I said, hey, you know, and I stopped calling her doctor at that point, I said, did you, do you remember going to college? And she says, yeah, it was, you know, it was the seventies. And then I said, well, I've been through college. I have four college degrees and it was expensive. Do you remember paying for college? And she says, well, I was on a graduate program. I'm like, okay. Well, college was long and arduous. Do you remember sitting in class? Do you remember graduating? And every question I asked her, she had a deflection of, and mm -hmm. I finally just flat out asked her, you've never been to college here. You know, the one thing she was, she worked in the lunchroom for spring semester in 1971. Oh now, here's the kicker. This woman not only never went to school, and anybody could do this. Anyone can call and check on these credentials. She wasn't, she not only fled the state then because we were, you know, she was being pursued, but she showed up in another state. And I ironically sat next to the, uh, the general counsel of that state, the, the state administrator who oversighted the licensing for state um, physicians. And they asked me to come back and reinvestigate her because she had just picked up her scam in another, another location. So don't just believe people on face value. People want to be trusting. People want to have good relationships. They, they don't want to be confrontive. Confrontation is difficult. But if you're going to put something important like your business, your wealth, your family's lives, you know, and in, in God we trust, all others we vet. <laughs> <laughs> I, li I like that. That's good. That's good. No, I think that's that, that's that got to be rule number one, right? You actually do have to do your due diligence. I mean, and I think that, frankly, um, entrepreneurs can tend to forget that because we tend not to be big fact finders. Right. We want to do the deal. We, we've got the vision. We uh, th this is going to work. And, and we like the person. Right. Oh, they're likable. Yep. OK, well, we want to vet that person. And what you're saying is there's just a lot of of open source information out there that isn't explored. What are some of the sources that you find? Yeah. I mean, Google. Now, I'm a I'm a big fan of uh, perplexity because I, I get I actually get um, the sources. Um, with perplexity that I don't get with Google. 
Um, so I that that's actually my preferred uh, source, but it's AI and, and AI is really giving us some tools that we have not had um, really before uh, to do this. But what are some of your favorite, um, what, what are some of the things that you like to use? What are some of the tools you like to use in order to do this vetting? Well, the one thing that really helps us fact find very quickly is when you're given an individual that you need to check their credentials on, you, you know, okay, you're a wealth manager. Who would be the agency that you would have to apply to, to say that you're a wealth manager? If you're an accountant, you need to be registered as an accountant. You might not be a CPA, but you do need to be registered. You know, any number of things. Hey, if you're a plumber or an electrician, your state consumer board is going to want to have you licensed. Uh, all of those careers have verification and fact checking. So if you go to your your state website, you know, newjersey.gov, um, minnesota.gov, they'll a couple mouse clicks through will give the consumer check will allow you to check the credentials of the person. They will also have the disciplined database. If anyone has filed a complaint against them, if they've gone ahead and done fiduciary misdeeds, or if they have anything where the state would maybe not necessarily take their license back, but find them, that will also be sitting there. It's a start. The next place I would look that's very common is newspapers. Read newspaper articles. People say, oh, newspapers are dead, but actually, Journalists are still out there reporting on companies, mm -hmm. connections, events in a community. So just do some newspaper searches. And those are really easy to search. Oh, super easy. I had a fellow, talk about wealth, right? So I had a fellow who went to a wealth seminar at a really not so established hotel. And he hosted this event and he popped up a sign and he said, here's my you know, wealth advisement. And, uh, you know, he's kind of playing himself off like he was the Tony Robbins of wealth. But sure enough, the everybody came out of there really jacked up. And I call this the charismatic yep. individual. They're excited. They're all ready to give him $10,000. But the wife of the fellow that, that, well, she called me and she said, Cynthia, I need you to just check him out. A newspaper search revealed that he had just gotten out of federal penitentiary for scams. <laughs> like It was an article popped up right there with his name and said, this man is fraudulent and horrible. And, you know, it just, it, it took very little for me to do that search. You know, I did it over the phone with her. That's how quick and easy it was. And we saved them embarrassment, uh, the pain of losing that money, the pain of trust, all of it. And, you know, they said, how can you just go about doing this again? And I was like, look, I can't tell you what the law is going to state, but I could tell you as an investigator, what power you have. And you can use open sources to find out this information before you get yourself fully involved with these individuals. No, this is this is so important. I um, years and years ago, I had a client that had a controller, and of course, controller—that's a very important position in a company because they are writing checks. Um, they are, you know, they're depositing. Uh, you know, the, they're they're checking the deposits come in. They're doing the accounting. Um, turned out, she had been stealing from them. D doing a check, we. Um, discovered because I'm the one who actually discovered it. We actually discovered that she, she'd been in, in prison for embezzlement. And the, um, the actually a very big search firm had found her for this company and had never done a criminal background check, never done a criminal background check. I mean, on a controller, I'm going, okay, that's the one that's one of those positions you must do a criminal background check. Uh, if they're not, uh, if they don't agree to a criminal background check, then probably should not be hiring them. Um, but sure enough, turned turned up immediately. Uh, they they'd been in. Uh, she'd been in prison for uh, embezzlement from a former employer. Um, she had a drug. It turned out she was uh, she had a serious drug problem, and so <laughs> that that's a. I mean, it's like it cost this client millions of dollars. Um, I've, I've worked many cases like this, unfortunately, unbelievable the lack of oversight. And, and, it, and it just seems like so easy to do that search. It's, it's, it's a couple dollars. Now, if a, if a company is onboarding new staff employees, and especially anyone who has got uh, a fiduciary responsibility or is responsible for, I would say any asset. And what do I think of as an asset? Not only property and, tangible goods, you know, things we insure, but 
you know, here at my company, what we tell our customers is we protect people, property, and reputation. That reputation is quite an asset today. So if we have somebody who's taking your name and putting it in a really bad light, you know, maybe you fired them or you let them go because they weren't performing and now they're they're going on to uh, uh, the, the websites like layoff.com and talking about you and saying you're a terrible company to work for. I mean, these are things you really have to watch for. The, the the financial predators, and we had one where she just moved from company to company and no one actually arrested her because they were too embarrassed at the millions of dollars that she mm. stole from them. And she was a secretary in the law firm, the law side of the company, writing checks to herself. And I recovered six million dollars of of cars, apartments, everything that she was just spending the money on. And and frankly, I think three different corporations knew exactly what they were doing once they saw it. But yes, uh, a little bit of due diligence, and this is this is what I say, a little bit of due diligence up front saves you a lot of investigation after the fact. So what are some of the other things that, um, you, I mean, give us uh, two or three really simple things that people ought to be looking for. Let's say if they're hiring a vendor or, because this all comes down to people, right? I mean, we're talking about people here. So mm -hmm. how do you do your due diligence on on people in general and maybe on vendors in specific well in fact when you're working with vendors we'll just kind of grab that one for a minute there might be some compliance requirements that you actually have to look at them and look and you know check the box to make sure that they're they're SOC compliant that they're uh meeting all the standards for your company to do operations especially if you're handling any kind of uh, data like financial data or personal information data you want to make sure that they have their act together. So you can give them a, an audit sheet. You can create a document that says, I need you to tell me all these key items because everything that touches you as a company, whether you're a supply chain partner, manufacturing, retail, you know, it could be anything that will cause you business disruption. I mean, you can run a boutique shop and you count on some lady to knit you tea cozies because you're going to sell lots of tea cozies and then she's, she falls off the planet and doesn't make you any tea cozies and you've got orders on the desk, you're in trouble. So how do you talk to that woman? A little small operation. How do you talk to her? And you say, well, you ask her, what's your backup plan? If you go on vacation, who am I going to call? Do you have other um, customers I could talk to that have worked with you in the past? Ask them for performance reviews. Now, when we're talking to the individuals, and that is a bit of an individual case there, but when we're talking to these companies, what kind of checklist should I be looking at? And the book has a lot of really good information in it about where to, you know, find this data source and look up that website. I, I would not want to make this a, a chat about independent websites. I want to talk about that source. So the state or the government agency will have it. Past performance and recommended um, customers will have it. And... You know, I do like Google when you could just ask Google, like, throw their name in there and see if you get any matches to newspaper articles that say they have criminal records or whatnot. And if you're really in doubt, do hire a licensed private investigator to just do a due diligence search. You don't that doesn't mean, you know, everyone thinks PIs are going to go out there and find the bad guys or cheating spouses. Most private investigators are actually working for small business professionals doing due diligence, doing exactly this work for, for frankly, a couple bucks. So, so let's talk about that for a minute. That, that's what you guys do, right? Yes, we're um, a licensed private detective agency. So so at what point do you hire somebody? Is it is it because you found something that you wonder? Or at what point do you actually go down that road? Two times when you want to bring in a specialist. The one time is the best time is before you get involved with them. So if you're bringing on vendors that are critical to your infrastructure, then you might just say, look, I need you to do a brief due diligence on them and make sure you say, like, I need seven years worth of data or five years worth of data. And they'll look in criminal records. They'll look in civil filings. Did this company break a lot of contracts and then go and sue their past customers? I mean, that could be a headache for you. Right. They'll um, they'll look at the background of the CEO and founder They'll, they'll check the box for you and they're going to give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down as to what their recommendation. But the next one is you might have these people already inside of your building and exactly that person you talked about earlier was very common. 
that uh, controllers, uh, inside accountants, anyone who's dealing with the books, we, I'm a fraud investigator. Uh, that's my specialty, which is why I do due diligence. So we have key indicators that we look for with these types of people. Do they never take a vacation or day right. off? They always have their hands on the books. Is the CEO or the next in charge so trusting of that individual that they don't really look at it? They just check the bank accounts. If that bank account doesn't move, most fraud happens in small bites. Yep. People don't come in and just take a million dollars and run away and buy a Maserati. Most of them are taking it like $20, $100, $1,000. So credit card statements. So if you start seeing that and you're like, this looks odd and you're truly suspicious of them, you can also hire a private investigator. And I would caution, I would even say a certified fraud examiner, a CFA, and many PIs are CFEs to say, I need you to do a discreet check. And this is perfectly legal and absolutely acceptable. Do a discreet check on my employee. I think that, I think they might be doing something wrong. Uh, but before I go and accuse them of something horrible and cause this break, great breakup in my office, I would like to know more. And the, hopefully the PI comes back and says, no, everything looks good. They're not, they're not spending money lavishly. They don't have a gambling habit, which is usually the case or drugs or, you know, an outside paramour situation, they 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 may have just done accounting bad. Again, they could just be incompetent. <laughs> and then and the company has a different, you know, that's a different podcast. How do you deal with, you know, badly placed, right person, wrong seat situation? Right. So so one thing that I've noticed over the years in my career, of course, I've dealt with thousands of entrepreneurs, is that um a lot of fraud is um, people go in with the, they borrow the money. They'd literally borrow it and pay it back. So these are not people that are, you would think of as fraudsters, right? I mean, they've actually been honest for many years. What I always tell people is um, in order to have somebody steal from you, they need both motive and opportunity. And you have no control over motive. You only have control over opportunity but you have no control over motive because somebody's motive can change at any time. The, the commonality of, of the white collar fraudster is when they're finally arrested, they almost always, I mean, there's actually a whole body language that they change. They're, they're glad they got caught because they feel this weight of guilt because frankly, they're honest people who suddenly become <laughs> dishonest. But it is in small bites. So the, a thing happened in your house. Uh, their their kids needed more care or better schooling. And, and gee, that money's just sitting there and no one's going to miss it. And I'm going to pay it back. And then nobody catches them. So they go back and they take more and they take more. Heck, we had a guy who committed fraud, was in jail. We called it Club Fed. Came out, was speaking at a fraud conference as a keynote speaker, telling everyone how he got away with the fraud. And I'm watching him at the podium. And I said... There's something wrong with this. And I'm in the back of the room on my cell phone, looking him up in PACER, which is the U.S. court system, which has all of our district courts. And he had just been called back into court for committing fraud again, only a week earlier. Ah. So he's he's teaching fraud specialists about how he committed fraud while he did fraud. So I had a little fun with him, Tom. I didn't say anything except to the host. And I'm like, you know, the guy that you're paying to come speak here is going to be back in court in a week and back in jail in a month. So we all go out to dinner that night. And this fraudster is like, so, Cynthia, what's it like to write a book? And how do you get a publisher? And how do you get more speaking gigs? Because he saw this as an opportunity to be the whistleblower slash public speaker. And I finally looked him straight in the eye. And I was like, you know, you're not going to get that opportunity because you know you're going back, right? And his whole demeanor changed, a little defensive, very defeated. Yeah, these are not like TV makes out these fraudsters to be like really, you know, this the 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 guy that's going to be in opposition to James Bond. But they're they're usually pretty mealy mouthed, uh, uncourageous individuals who are just getting away with this. And it's very easy to corner them. Uh, but I should also caution, if you're not comfortable doing that, please bring in the proper authorities. Yeah, that, that's my next question. So let's say that you do discover this, okay, or you suspect it, okay? What are your next steps? Uh, probably the quickest way to get any type of result is to contact local law enforcement. Now, your local 
police department, like I love my police department here. I think they're wonderful. They're not really equipped to handle financial fraud. So you might be going to the local prosecutor's office. Every county in every state has a prosecutor's office who should have someone who's aligned with white collar crime and or will know who to pass you off to. And we had a case where a friend of mine had um, one of her employees used all her credentials, all the owner's credentials, and set up a shop that looked exactly like hers, and then went and started stealing all of her customers, unbeknownst to her former Oh, employer. yeah. That case took a year and a half, and did she receive any compensation back? No. Is this because that woman who stole from her is not going to be sitting on a pile of cash to be able to pay back the fraud. But the owner had the satisfaction of seeing the prosecutors come and arrest her and take her out of the country club she was sitting in and and frankly, publicly shame her for being a fraudster. And, um, you know, that was a moment for her. But it's the prosecutor's office that will handle that case for you. So, so let me ask a question. So how do you, so <clears throat> how do you deal with people that are fraudsters in your industry? So in other words, they are, I mean, take the financial planner you're talking about, right? Who said he was a financial planner and turned out that he was, had this whole, whole long list. Um, but there's, and they tend to have that charisma that you're talking about, right? So they're very charismatic. Um, they just, they're, they're just, basically stealing somebody else's stuff. They're just passing themselves off because they read a book. I mean, I can't tell you how many people have read my book, Tax Free Wealth, held it up on stage and said, I do what Tom does only cheaper. Yeah. So how, how do you deal with that? Well, I consider that fraud um, because from an integrity standpoint, to me um, personally, that would be fraud for me to do something that was not mine. How do you deal with that when it's not a vendor, it's not an employee, not somebody under your control, how, how do you deal with these people out there that are um, not passing themselves off as you per se, although I do have people pass themselves off of, as, as me, which is shocking for a, an accountant, right? But I do. Um, and and then how, how do you deal with that other than, you know, like contact whoever they're, you know, they're, they're talking to, but they're out there on the internet. Is there anything you can do about that? Um, it's, it's horrifying when your reputation gets dragged down into the mud because people are pretenders. And unfortunately, that lowest class lack integrity. Um, there's one part of me that'll say you just need to rise above it and still remain as spectacular as you are and just prove in concept that every day you deliver a product that you, that you promised in your book, in your lectures, and in your work. Uh, pretenders will get found out as they're committing this horrifying fraud. And, and myself, I've owned my own company. I've been in this, I've been in this field for 30 years and my company's 25 years old. And I've got people walk right up and say, well, I've been doing OSINT for, you know, 16 years and I'm better than Cynthia. And, I, and I'm like, go for it, buddy. Go for it. If you think you're better than me, I, I don't honestly, I let it kind of bounce off of me because they'll wash out. I mean, I worked the biggest fraud case that ever hit this country. I worked on the Bernie Madoff case. That man was a genius. He was a he full was. sociopath where yeah. he would he took money from a little old lady the day he went in and turned himself in. He literally came off an elevator and Esther said to Selma, talk to Bernie, he'll take it. And he took a check from her, had a check in his pocket. I mean, there's just some people that are just you don't sink to their level and and you know, ruin your day over it. But if you find that there's a pretender, and especially for you, Tom, because you are a credentialed individual, you can report them to your state agency. And at least there'll be some sort of mark there that says if someone else does their due diligence, like, oh, this guy's not a good actor. And um, confronting them is not going to help. I mean, they're nope. just going to if they have no integrity to steal your to steal your thunder, then do you think coming at that coming at them is going to scare them? No, they're probably going to take a picture with you and say, "Look, yeah, even Tom thinks I'm great," and you know, misalign again. Yep, no, no question. So, um, last question: um, How is AI impacting your due diligence? Oh, business is brisk. Thank you, artificial intelligence. Uh, AI has created. Uh, so many uh, 
problems. AI is great. Let me start with AI is amazing. And in the right hands and in the right use, AI is very effective as a tool for all of us. And I'm excited about it. But AI is also being used uh, by state actors to create misinformation and disinformation and all walks. So pharmaceuticals are dealing with it. Campaigns are dealing with it. Teenagers are dealing with it. Everybody has a problem with false content, false information. I would say, go back to what you think. If you're presented with information and you think, uh, this is a little too targeted to me. You know, I said the word shoes yesterday and now I'm getting shoe advertisements. And, you know, that seems a little weird. Just go down to the source and keep digging. And if you recognize something that looks familiar to you, like, oh, this is Bloomberg or the New York Times, you know, and not, you know, Intercept or, you know, Bob's website.com. I mean, I don't mean to say that Bob doesn't have good content out there, but I'm going to trust a valid source that I recognize from business school or library school or any other, you know, platform that I come from. It's like an old Italian expression, like we know our own. <laughs> No, it's it's a it's a good point. I, I I think you know I um like you I I do a lot of public speaking and so I find that there I I'm challenged by that industry. It's the seminar industry is full of fraudsters, absolutely chock full of them. There are some great people out there that have great messages and they're amazing, um, but that is not maybe even fifty percent. So it's uh, I, I think this idea of doing your, you know, open source intelligence gathering is so critical in our world because everything, everybody, I mean, I've got notes. I, I, I when I get a, a great guest, that has got great information. I'm taking, I'm taking more notes than anybody out there listening or watching um, because I'm going, Oh, I need to be doing due diligence here. I need to be doing dil due diligence there. So just remember, I mean, this can solve a lot of issues. Um, let me ask you one, if I can. I said it was last question. It wasn't. Yes. This is the last question um, before we have you kind of kind of give us your your final thoughts. And, and and that is, let's say that you have had somebody out there because you talked about the assets, right? We talk about, let's say they actually stole from you. We get what to do there. What about from a reputation standpoint? What what if they went out there and damaged your reputation? What do you do? Uh, there are reputation firm companies out there that can help with this. Uh, they can feel both like they're almost a combination of public relations and investigative resources. You might actually even be dealing with a law firm at that point. It depends on the m amount of impact. If someone just gives you a bad Yahoo review for your restaurant, you know, I in something like that, I just immediately would tell the customer, go in there and respond to the comment. We're so sorry you didn't like your dinner you know, come back in, the next meal's on us. But uh, because it'll get worse, it will get worse. People will, you know, don't try to ignore it. But if someone is truly trying to damage what your reputation is and they're calling you out, you're going to have to face that off. And you do want to do that with the proper language and the right tactic and strategy. Uh, the internet is very sensitive with this now. And, I, you know, TikTok could change a reputation overnight. Yep. You know, Twitter can pivot people's careers and campaigns. And we do work on some pretty high profile people who've been in some really bad situations to help move that. It is a team effort, but there is a team out there that can help you with this. Right. That's that's uh, great to know. So um, final words, how do you find people? Um, I, certainly we want to recommend your book, um, OSINT. Uh, and definitely people should be, I, I will be, I will absolutely be reading this this book like tomorrow. Um, but outside of reading your book, how do you find somebody uh, <laughs> reputable um, that can actually help you with these specific things? Um, because you can't always trust what you find on Google. That's an excellent question. So how do you get to the right professional to help you with the challenging question you have? Every state has a licensed private investigator association. So my first mark of I'm going to hire a PI in Michigan or I'm going to get another investigator out of Minnesota, I'll go to the state association website. Any, any PI who's worth their weight is going to spend a couple bucks and join their own association. That's your first credibility. 
The second, I might interview a few investigators on that list and ask them if they can handle the specific issue that I have. Do know that a lot of investigators, here's our credibility problem, uh, say that they could do all things. I mean, if, if their website is, I do bug sweeping and I do reputation management and I'll do surveillance and I, I do uh, matrimonial issues and, you know, like they do the whole, nobody does it all. There are specialists. Nobody does that, it all well. Yes. Oh, absolutely. So you can look within the list and these lists are all searchable for someone who handles business or white collar. That's kind of the key words we want here for them. And then ask that investigator for some references of past performance. And then, uh, you know, we all kind of know each other in the field. There's not a lot of us, but there's certainly many other professionals out there other than myself that I would recommend in a heartbeat. Awesome. Thank you. Um, final words, uh, uh, Cynthia. Well, most particularly for our entrepreneurs, because I am also an entrepreneur. I say I've run my business for 25 years, but we've gone through such a big rebuild in this past year that I've got the whole spirit. I've lost sleep and, you know, I'm, I'm just as enthusiastic and running with good ideas like everyone else. Uh, I don't want you to I don't want you to uh, diminish that that go get them this. I don't want you to feel like you have to be hesitant in every relationship you go into. I need you as an entrepreneur to feel the fire and the excitement that's going to bring that next product or service to market because that's that's you. That's all you. But if you surround yourself with really smart people like a great accountant, a good attorney, you know, have an have an investigator friend, you know, start interviewing without needing them. You know, they're just as impactful for your business doing due diligence for you as any other professional. In fact, my biggest market when I came out and it continues to be is accounting firms, not lawyers, mm. because everybody turns their accountant when they have a question. Yep. Your accountant's not ticking a clock off like the for attorney. Sure. And the accountant is just so reasonable and has a linear way of thinking that goes, oh, A equals to B to C to D. So if you surround yourself with, with people you do trust, they will help you through the hard times when you come across people that you can't trust. I, I love it. I love it. Once again, the um, book is OSINT and the uh, website is heatheringtongroup.com. Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us. It's just been a wealth of information. Please go out and get the book. Um, use it because as Warren Buffett, likes to say the most important part of investing is not losing money. And uh, the quick, one of the easiest way to lose money is when somebody is damaging an asset. And I love the way you put that, Cynthia. Um, you like this episode, please, you know, please click like, please share this with uh, and subscribe and please share this with your friends because I think this kind of topic, this is the way um, at WealthAbility we make way more money and pay way less tax. Thanks everyone, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Cynthia. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.